Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Woodstock, Georgia, it's time for Cherokee Business Radio. Now, here's your host. Well, hello and welcome to the inaugural show. This is a new show called Fearless Formula on Cherokee Radio X. And this is where we talk about the ups and downs in the business world and offer words of wisdom for business success. And I am your host, Sharon Klein. And our guest in the studio currently serves as the Director of Implementation and Impact of Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And she has dedicated her career to supporting nonprofits from diverse sectors in producing measurable outcomes for the people they serve. I love your bio, Anna. Please join me in welcoming Anna Kawar. Hey. Hello. Hi, Sharon. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So happy you've made it to the studio today. So again, this is our first show uh, called Fearless Formula. And I know we talk a lot about fearlessness, generally speaking, but actually it's more about fear and how you manage it. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about kind of your journey in um, coming from a different country, coming over here to the United States, and kind of how you've gotten to the position you're in. Oh wow, at Boys yeah. and Girls Club. I know it's a big broad. But it's you a, touch on what you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good story. I feel like um, uh, it really does all tie together for me. So um, I was born in the Middle East in Jordan. Um, my father is originally Arab American. He was born and raised in New York, but his father's from Jordan, and then my mother's from Dublin, Ireland. Um, so they met in the Middle East and I was born there and I spent most of my life there, although we would go back to the States every once in a while um, to visit my dad's brothers and cousins. Um, but uh, one influential point in my life, my uh, to the summer of ninth and 10th grade, my dad said to us, we're moving to upstate New York and we were living in Oman at the time. And I'd never been to an American high school, uh, let alone um, you know, actually live in the States for any amount of time that I could remember. And I was terrified, absolutely terrified. Um, because what scared you? Yeah. What was it? Well, this, and I think this is applicable to a lot of us, but we have, you know, I had a lot of preconceived notions about what the States was like, especially, especially the world of American teenagers. Let's just, you know, <laughs> did you watch like Disney channel? Oh, uh, well, things over first there? of all, yeah. Jordan TV had, Basically, Saved by the Bell, Friends, <laughs> and Seinfeld, oh and my. then, you know, just those typical uh, movies and things about the jocks and the cheerleaders and the nerds and cliques and people getting beaten up and all that of that. I scare anybody, probably. Yeah, <laughs> so all you, um, all I had in my mind was I'm not going to fit in. I, I was a nerd. I loved school. Loved school. Mm-hmm. My sister was way more popular than me, so she, we, I already knew we were going to be in separate camps, but... Was it when you got here? Did it did it live up to your your expectations? American well, high school. Well, luckily, we were in a smaller town in upstate New York, so there was there were definitely the groups and the cliques, but it was a small enough school that everybody still got along mm-hmm. or knew each other. Um, so I, you know, I fit in pretty well, and I kind of had group. I had friends from all different groups, which was really nice, but. The biggest thing that impacted me, though, was just the different the culture shock of going from really some of the poorest countries in the world to the richest country in the world and the difference in um, how people live their lives and the issues that they face on a daily basis. So do you think that that influenced you in wanting to become uh, associated with boys and girls clubs? And well, it really it really, I think, is where my nonprofit career came from, um, because what the way I say it now, looking back, I couldn't understand why the richest country in the world had the problems that it did and why people were struggling so much. Um, the, the one of the things that was very obvious to me was that, you know, coming from developing countries, people are resource poor, but their family and happiness rich is kind of how I think about it. Um, so be- interesting. Culturally, it's a much more tribal culture. It's much more based on your social network. That's what gives you wealth. That's what gives you status is who, what's your last name? Who's your family? Um, who are you connected to? In the States, we're very individualistic. We It's much more about what you own, your resources. And so, um, so if you're not resource rich, 
you it, you kind of almost lose the uh, ability to be happiness rich in this in a sense. And so people I noticed being in this small town in upstate New York where people were pretty poor, um, you know, living in, in mobile homes and on farms and just not necessarily in a city where people had more money. They were also really struggling with, um, you know, broken families, substance abuse, um, just in very self-destructive ways of living. And it confused me. It really confused me. It helped me understand a lot of things about my own family, but it um, it really confused me because I, I just thought, why can't we figure out a way to fix these resource inefficiencies so that people can really live the lives that they could given you know, the, what, what we have in this country. So that really kind of launched my, um, obsession with wanting to (laughs) fix the social system. Um, not necessarily from a, uh, you know, give everybody everything lens, but more like, where are the, where are the breakdowns? Um, so fascinating because someone who lives in this grows up this way may not have that same exact perspective. So it's a gift in a way for you to come in during your teenage years and see the world, that you thought was going to be kind of like, you know, Disney, Disney fied yeah. <laughs> or whatever and see it now kind of with a, a different lens. I love that because not everybody gets that gift. So it's really actually says a lot about your character that you've continued on this path for your living. So tell me what you do. I know that you are the implementation and impact director, senior director. It's very important <laughs> at Boys and Girls Clubs. Tell me what that position is like for you. So um, essentially my job is to think about how we can improve the level of scale of implementation, which I'll explain in a second, and the quality of impact. So the way I like to think about it is that we have a lot of great stuff at Boys and Girls Clubs of America, which is our national organization that serves all of the Boys and Girls Clubs across the country who are all independent 501c3s. Um, we have no direct authority over them other than setting a minimum standard of compliance to certain rules and regulations, but they're all their own organization, their own board, their own culture. So I didn't know that. Yeah. And so not many people realize that. And so what we, what we at national have to do is really through influence and through education. Um, and so we have a lot of great stuff that we can, that we've developed, that we have that's research based, that's evidence based, that's proven to work for impacting young people and helping set them up for success. Um, that we need to get out there and, and help, um, the individual clubs, uh, implement successfully. So it's about building awareness that these tools and resources exist across, and we're talking close to 1200 independent organizations that we're trying to work with and, and support. It's a lot um, of moving parts, yes. I imagine. So um, building awareness of what we have and then supporting them to implement it well. Um, and then, and ultimately the goal then is to, is to create a consistent level of quality across the country where a young person can walk into any single boys and girls club anywhere in the country and be promised um, the same level of outcomes and experience um, that we know really will impact them throughout their whole lives. What I love too is you've you've had a lot of um, celebrities associated with Boys and Girls Clubs. So you can mm-hmm. can you tell me a little bit about that? I know that we had spoken not long ago about oh my goodness, Magic Johnson. Yeah, yes, yeah. Magic Johnson was at our national conference in May in Chicago and was a huge hit. He was uh, he he went a, he went a little bit rogue in terms of the what was planned for his session, but he delivered above and beyond, and it was so fun, and people loved him. Did he talk about? being associated with boys and girls clubs when he was younger. Yeah. So um, we have a number of celebrities that went to the clubs as children. Um, uh, A lot of NFL stars. um, Hulk Hogan is, is associated. Um, Denzel Washington is our national spokesperson. So is Jennifer Lopez. Um, We have Misty Copeland, the ballet dancer um, uh, learned ballet at, at boys and girls clubs was introduced to it. Um, so we have a, a number of folks that have, uh, that went to clubs as children or as teenagers and were, and really found their calling in some way through it, um, or were just given a place where they were shown that somebody really cared about their future and felt motivated and supported to, um, to pursue their dreams. And, and so a lot of folks then 
um, are kind enough to come back and share those stories with us, with, with folks in the public. And um, Denzel Washington was just awarded the Presidential Medal of Honor for his service to Boys and Girls Clubs of America, which has been for almost three decades now. Wow. Um, so, yeah, we have a great, great relationships with a lot of people. It's crazy because all of these children whose lives you're impacting, there's no way to see or measure what that exact impact is. So to be able to have people come back and say, this really meant something to my life. It must be very emotional too. Is that what's most satisfying for your job? What would you say is most satisfying to you? I think that for me personally, um, I, (laughs) this sounds a little harsh, but (laughs) I've never been one to want to directly work with a, a young person and, and, and see, um, you know, I, I'm not a mother. Uh, I've, I haven't had children of my own and, and I, um, I love kids, but I've never been one to want to directly mold them or shape them. It's, sure. But what I, what I love doing is helping the people who are really good at that do that even better. So I worked with teachers, um, before this job, I worked in ca- California in education. So I worked with a lot of teachers and principals and school folks that, are so unbelievably passionate about what they do and but yet can the the system is so complex and they can get so stuck in the bureaucracy and so my job was to help them break through and find ways to really impact youth um with uh in alongside all of the other stuff they had to deal with but um I love finding those paths to impact I love I'm I'm a mapper I love to say okay if this is where we want to be, how do we get there? What do we know works? What do we know from evidence? How can we test things? How, what data do we need to collect? How can we stay youth focused? How can we stay um, aligned with our values? Um, and, and you just said, you know, we don't always know what's going to impact a young person, but we do know a lot. One of the scariest um, statistics is that you can predict whether somebody's going to end up in the prison system by their third grade reading level. Oh my goodness. So where so there are prison um organizations that literally plan for capacity based on the literacy rate of third graders. Oh my gosh. It's such it's horrible. that it's that predictable wow. and so we know so much about how to prevent um, negative outcomes, and we know a lot about how to build positive outcomes. And so that's really my favorite thing in the world is to watch an organization really get super clear on that North Star and the path towards it um, and help them lead the way in doing that. Do you think that there are some some misconceptions about Boys and Girls Clubs or your industry that you're in, what are some things that you think that people don't understand or would need to know? I think one of the biggest things that we battle is that um, Boys and Girls Clubs are not just a daycare organization. (laughs) Um, You know, I I think in practice it can feel that way because you drop them off and then you pick them up and they're in this place while you're at work or whatnot. Yeah, Yeah. and they're just playing and having fun. Yeah. Um, but part of that, uh, mission of, of preparing youth for the future is to ensure that there is a, um, a curriculum of a set of programs and really thoughtful structures that ensure that that young person is physically safe, emotionally safe, um, and thriving and, and exposed to opportunities, exposed to, um, ideas for their future and, uh, support in their academics. Um, so, when they're in those walls, they are not just um, being kept physically safe. They are also being developed. And that's, um, that's something that a lot of folks don't really understand. Well, on a personal sort of level, um, who are your mentors or people that you look to, to sort of help navigate through not just this position, but a position you had previously, like through your career, did you have a particular person or did you read a particular book that you thought was impactful? Um, I think that from on the mentor level of why I'm doing what I'm doing now, I think, you know, I, (laughs) I graduated from college. I was 21. I was, went to Cornell university and I, I finished and I moved to Boston with my best friend at the time. And I had no idea. I honestly had no idea what I wanted to do for a job. I had studied public health. I thought thought I wanted to go to medical school, but then I switched to public health and, um, I started sending out resumes and I ended up as an executive assistant at this public, at this nonprofit healthcare nonprofit. 
And the CEO, the president CEO at the time was a man named Don Berwick, um, who I always say, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid very young Mm because I started at 21 in this organization under his leadership and an, and a woman, our chief operating officer was Maureen Bisignano, who was an amazing Bostonian woman with the best Boston accent. Oh, I love it. Um, wicked this. And oh, wicked she that, was you know? great. And um, the two of them were pioneers in the field of, of quality improvement, specifically in healthcare. But for me, um, I fell in love with, I thought I wanted to be in healthcare, but I fell in love with quality improvement. I fell in love with problem solving, with fixing stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, and so I've always been inspired by their work of really setting the tone and saying, there is no reason why we can't provide reliable outcomes in the social sector. That is kind of what has been my driving force. Um, And, but I think on a personal level, you know, I've, I've had a lot of mentors in the sense that I have a lot of people that inspire me. Um, one of my best friends, her name is Yuvini. She's, um, out in San Francisco. We took some time together to work on a leadership development organization. Uh, she is, um, I always call her like my soul sister because Uh we went to high school together in Jordan. She's from Sri Lanka. Um, and we graduated together in Jordan and And she came over here too. And then she, yeah, she ended up in the States as well. And we, um, we, she was, she's the person that has always helped me understand myself and my values and what matters to me. And I think if anything has helped me stay focused and manage fear and that imposter syndrome and feeling of doubt, it's been staying in touch with that why um literally feeling it in your chest like this matters to me this is my purpose this is why i'm here this is important um and just i think sometimes i need to do that and just sit there and remind myself of why i'm doing something and then all the anxiety kind of goes to the background Well, if you're just joining us, uh, we are speaking with Anna Kawar. She is the Senior Director of Implementation and Impact at Boys and Girls Clubs of America. What I like that you just talked about is that it's so easy. I mean, I live in imposter syndrome. (laughs) That's my calling card. (laughs) I'm the best at mental torture and (laughs) uh, questioning whether or not I deserve anything. Anyway, I just really appreciate that you mentioned how having a friend to kind of keep you on track and answer the why is actually so important because I get into my head where why is not even, it's just because I want to do this because I want to do this or, but having a why shifts the focus out of, should I, do I need to deserve this? How am I good enough? Any of that, but to having actually something to do a problem to solve. It becomes about the problem Mm -hmm. and not about me, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate you brought that up because I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, and it's wonderful that you had early on some very important people in your life that you can kind of go back to and remember what their philosophies are to, to continue on with your journey right now. Yeah, I think, um, I think from a professional standpoint, it took me a while of being, you know, a bit lost as we all are um, and and dealing with some own, some of my own stuff from my past that has held me back. And and I've been, you know, working through a lot of that, but, um, but now looking back, it's a lot, it's become easier to stay in touch with that. And, um, and I think, you know, it's funny because it, it'll, my own personal journey of trying to figure that out aligns with what I do for work because, for me, a nonprofit, an organization that doesn't understand its why and ultimately what it's trying to accomplish is not going to get very far. Um, and and I think that is the tr- is true. It's the same for people. I mean, we um, if you have goals, you need to stay in touch with that why and make sure that it really resonates with you, with you, with your values, with your intentions, with your hopes for yourself. Um, Do you think that's how people can almost make, like I'm saying, their own fearless formula? There are ways to combat, um, well, in your industry or even just your position, what are some of the ups and downs that you experience that could potentially throw you off track? Well, I mean, uh, you know, if you're talking uh, from an entrepreneur perspective, I'm, I'm sure that there's a ton when I tried doing it on my own. I mean, I'm not well wired for entrepreneurship just because, I, um, 
I'm very externally motivated and I, and I'm very um, extroverted and I need a lot of people around me and, you this know, pandemic must have been hard for you. Yeah, that was really hard. But um, so I'm sure, you know, places like here in Woodstock, where we have such an amazing entrepreneur community, I, I, I can't imagine the value of that to, to, to people who are entrepreneurs. But being in a large organization, um, I mean, Boys and Girls Clubs is a complex animal. It's massive. I mean, before the pandemic, we were serving 500,000 children would walk through the doors of a boys and girls club every day. Wow. So we're talking about half a million youth every day are in some boys and girls club somewhere. And so the scale is immense. And then we have, you know, 500 staff or so at the national office. So when you're working in the level of complexity like that, you can get really lost in both feeling, both being in your own head about, what's the point of doing this? It's never going to get anywhere. I, I don't even, does it even make sense? Nobody's going to listen to me. Everybody's got all these other things going on. You know, there's that, but then there's also just navigating the complexity of the organization. How do you get your strategy, your ideas out there? How do you, um, you know, I'm very motivated by problem solving. I don't care if it's my idea or not my idea. I just want to solve the problem. So how do we get people in the room? How do we solve the problems? How do we move forward? That's all that throws me for a loop and I get really overwhelmed. And some, I actually just had this experience this week where I was feeling super shut down mm. um, and just very overwhelmed and frozen. Um, where do you find your inspiration to kind of come back from that? Cause that can derail anybody that happens to me probably once a day. At least. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and this was bad. Like it was a couple of days in a row of feeling every time I started to do something, this just sinking feeling um, how do you combat that? Yeah. I mean, I, what I was, I was lucky enough to have a, um, I'm, I'm in a leadership program that that's wrapping up and I have an amazing, um, pair of colleagues that we're in a little peer coaching group with, and we have this great executive coach. So this, I'm lucky enough to have that resource. And I, that call was literally that morning and I said, okay, well, I guess I'm bringing this to the call, even though I feel super vulnerable saying this. <laughs> Um, but I just was really honest and, and, you know, that's one of the, that's actually a piece of feedback that I've gotten from colleagues is that I'm willing to be vulnerable and that inspires them. So I'm not afraid to go and say, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm struggling, (laughs) please help. And, and that I think, uh, humanizes things for other people too. And then we can have real conversations about what needs to be done. So I said to them, I feel frozen. I feel overwhelmed. I feel stupid for feeling this way because I know exactly what I need to do, but I can't physically bring myself to do it because I'm so, I'm just feeling very lost. And we had just had a whole conversation about purpose and getting tactical and taking it one step at a time. And, you know, we had a pretty high level conversation, but I think something clicked for me where I just said, Anna, do one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And I got up on my whiteboard and I just brain dumped everything in my head and just kept massaging it and it came together into a plan. And all of a sudden I was like, wow, I feel clear. <laughs> I feel clearer. I love the one step at a time because I get overwhelmed as well. But one of the reasons why I wanted to call this show Fearless Formula is because I think that is a very normal human emotion mm-hmm. we all experience in so many different ways. And I let fear make decisions for me too often. And so I guess that's kind of what I like is that when you talk about um, highlighting an emotion that we all can identify with. There is a level of bravery. It's vulnerable, but there's, there's bravery and vulnerability. And so being able to say I'm over, I don't even know what I'm doing. Like that's for me, I, I feel like that um, takes all of the ego and all of the bravado people carry and just kind of breaks it down to just you're human and I'm a human. And this is how I feel, whether it has nothing to do with judgment, you know, it Mm -hmm. just is what it is. And I really appreciate your sharing that because I think many people, including myself would be much more willing to be like, nah, you know, I'm good. I got it. I got it. But most of the time I'm inside, like crying out loud. I don't think I got anything. going. (laughs) Well, I think, I think, I I can imagine, I know vulnerability is hard for a lot of people, but I think um, one thing that I like to think about for myself is um, fear can come from a lot of different places. And I think it's important to think about where is, where is that fear coming from? So if I'm scared of being vulnerable, if I'm scared to, to admit that I'm stuck, 
why? Where is that fear coming from? Is it because I don't want to look stupid? Is it because I'm shaming myself for not being able to figure this out myself? So I know I have colleagues who are much more concerned with status and what people think of them than I am. So for them being vulnerable in that sense is really hard mm. for me. What, what drives my fear is I self shame. And I say, I should be able to do this. I, I'm, you I should can't, yourself. I, I should sh- myself yeah. all day long. Uh, yeah. There's no good reason why I can't do this myself. What's wrong with you, Anna? So I have to, I have to use different tactics than somebody else would have to use to be vulnerable because for them, maybe announcing it to a group of four people is a little bit harder, but finding one person you trust is a better way to do it. For me, I don't mind if they know that I'm struggling, but what I do mind is um, being judged that I should know better. So I'm not going to go to somebody who's going to tell me I'm an idiot because I can't do it myself. Right. So I think I would, my recommendation to people would be to get clear on what your, where your fear is coming from in that sense and pick a tactic that specifically addresses that so that you can be vulnerable and ask for help. Cause that's really at the end of the day, what we all should get better at doing. <laughs> what do you think you're not afraid of anymore? What do you think you've been able to kind of learn a good technique or I mean, tool or tool, something that will kind of help you yeah. to ground yourself some, I don't know. I, I have been in therapy many times, so I have some techniques. That yeah. I and- join the club. I, you know, one thing <laughs> that I, one thing that I have gotten better at and that I has really helped me is getting more comfortable with the process. Um, so part of that should has been like, I should know the answer and I should um, know what's going to happen when and have and and be able to get there quickly. Um, so I've gotten much more comfortable with the fact that things take time and I don't know the answer now and I have to let things unfold and I have to trust the process and I have to be patient and wait for results or wait for the knowledge or wait for the insight. So you tell yourself, I just need to be patient. I tell myself it'll come. Oh, <laughs> I tell you myself, have faith. I tell myself. <laughs> so when I'm confused by something, I used to get really frustrated and I used to, and sometimes I would take that out on people around me as in like, you need to explain this to me. This doesn't make sense to me. And I would try to force the understanding. And now I'm much more willing to sit back and just let conversations unfold without needing to jump in, without needing to control the conversation, without needing to have an answer. And I just say, you know what, I'm just going to listen and see how this goes for a couple of days. And if I, and then I, not only will the answer maybe come, but the questions will come, the the right questions will come. Cause I don't even know what the, I don't even know questions to ask right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, you know, is also on a personal level too, like not rushing relationships, not having to have an answer is like, what's going to happen where this is going to go and what does this mean? And, um, uh, and friendships and, you know, where your life is going and where should I, where should, you know, I grew up moving around the world. I've never had a home before a place where I can put roots down. And I never knew that the first time I walked into Woodstock, I would say to myself, I love this town. I want to live here. (laughs) And then a year later I buy a house here and I had no idea that that was going to happen, but I, I trusted that somewhere would feel that way at some point, And I've gotten better at that. Do you think that if like four years ago, someone would have said in four years, you're going to own a house and you're going to live in this town and you're going to be setting down roots and it's not going to be so nomadic and you're not a gypsy and all of these things. Like, would that have overwhelmed you at that moment? It's so interesting to me that things happen in the time that you're ready for them to happen or, yeah. or you allow things to happen when you're ready. I guess I agree. I mean, and I was, I was married and living in California four years ago. So that would have come as a very big shock. (laughs) And also I was still in a place where I was scared to settle down and to like put roots down somewhere because I, I wasn't ready Mm -hmm. to face the fear of commitment that I needed to work through for my own, from my own nomad upbringing. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, it was a nomadic. Okay. To say, because I don't know if that's a good word or not. Okay. Well, um, if people wanted to contact you and want more information about what you do, or even more information about boys and girls clubs, or just even to chit chat with you, what do you think would be the best way for them to contact you? Yeah, I, I use LinkedIn a lot. So, um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Anna Kawar, K-A-W-A-R. I know it's a, it's a, that's an Arabic last name. Um, uh, boys and girls of America. I'm, I'm always on there so you can connect with me. I have a pretty big network too. So I'm always happy to connect people with other people. And if you're thinking about nonprofit careers or, 
um, you know, definitely happy to connect anyone to, to folks they may want to talk to more. Well, Anna, thank you so much for joining us on Fearless thank you. Formula. I had so much fun chatting with you today, and I hope some people can take some good words of wisdom for themselves. And uh, again, this is Sharon Klein, and I am reminding you that with wisdom and understanding, we can all have our own Fearless Formula. Have a great day.